Hi, I'm Lee McCloskey. I want to invite you to a conversation about the mystery and meaning of tarot. I spent 17 years revisioning as an artist, as an author, as a visual philosopher, the major arcana of the tarot. And my book, Tarot Revision, takes us on a journey that helps us access our inner guidance, understand the nature of imagination, and how to ask questions that let us access this inner storehouse of wisdom and possibility and navigate the great question of what does it mean to be human. So join me. This is what helps us understand that you could almost say these qualities that, that were in the Hermetic tradition that, that ask us, well, what is tarot? Why does it matter? And how can I use it creatively? What is genius? I started to think about these just as sort of an introduction into, first of all, what is tarot? Why is it helpful? Tarot means wheel. Tarot is the structure of the psyche likened to a piano, the keys, meaning that when you understand it's not what key do you like any more than on a piano, you begin to understand all of these keys that once you understand that you are to play them, you will create music rather than just dissonance or rather than just staring at the keys going, nothing happens. You see? <laughs> Once as you've built a form, now you have to do something with the form. And that's what this is saying, that how can I use it creatively? And that's the point in all of this work. Art says, and acting, music, this is what I love about the arts. It says, an artist say, listen, I don't want to believe. I don't want to follow. I don't want to be told I'm wrong. What I want is the inspiration of how do I amplify my connection to these things. And that's why the tarot has been so helpful. And as I can honestly say, I couldn't have done the upstairs had I not done this. And if you think about the amount of time involved, 17 years on these drawings and on the book. And I started thinking about the symbolism in that. I said, that's when you leave home. That's when you say, Dad, you know what? I'm 17, I've learned that the Empress is not the devil, so I'm going out the front door. And Dad says, great kid, you gotta go find your way in the world. And if you think about leaving home, and we did, we, for thousands of years, we left. For thousands of years, we've been trying to find our way home, like E.T. and Dorothy. You know, this is why those stories resonate. Why is my heart so broken? Why does it hurt so much? Why am I never home? Why at the end of everything does it seem to add up to nothing? And the key is we can't know what it adds up until we return to intimacy. In a sense, only the poet's heart in each of us says, yes, maybe it wasn't that much, but it was everything. And that was enough. There's a beauty in that. And I think it's the way we love Rilke, why we love Ro Rumi. You don't need to convince me with harshness or your anger. I'm over that. Like a garden, convince me with what is interesting to you. And that's why in terms of what is genius, we have a very Western intellectual sense that genius is being smart. That's not what genius is. We have to go back to the Greeks. Genius is the tutelary spirit, the mentor within us, that says that you don't, I don't come to you why you went through your mystery schools, through your initiations? Think of a dancer. You don't become a great prima ballerina by showing up and going, I want to dance. It's beyond wanting to dance. You've shown up dancing since you were three years old. It is as natural to be prima ballerina. Uh, do you see? And that's different because that's what's saying consciousness is not a drug. It's not something you're entitled to. You're not an old soul that goes, I'm supposed to get it and not have the difficulty. And that's what, you know, Dolly said it best. I've always struck with me as an artist. He said, no artist ever created a masterpiece. And I thought, that's us, man. We're a masterpiece. We've worked our butts off across the ages. And the big payoff is we think we're so ordinary. And that seems to be the curse. But the tarot says, no, that's the beginning. Think about ordinary. Now you can stand up and be a king. Now you can stand up and be a devil. Now you can stand up and be a queen. But you can also come back home to what's intimate, meaningful to you. And that's the beauty, I think, for us in our journey of rediscovering our genius. Our genius is the relationship we have with that quality of our consciousness that says, when you love me enough to continue like Job, no matter how difficult, to just keep doing it because that's the choice you make. Do you know? And I think that's the great heroism of our species, not like what was in it for me, but before I died, I said, I'm going to do something with this. And that's where Hermes, the Hermetic Symbolical Wisdom Tradition, shows us this story, again in imagery of light and dark. And why I wanted to show this just simply was that to start saying that many of the things we think are very recent are very ancient, and this is one of them. 
and that's why the symbolical tradition it takes us back to Hermes. And this is such a famous quote from the Emerald Table of Hermes, saying, "'Tis true without lying, certain and most true. That which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below to do miracles of one only thing." Now, again, the great resource we have here is to realize the above and the below literally in the space. That the qualities of the imagination being given form and expression in balance. And that's the, the, the goal of Hermes. And that's why as we enter Tarot Revisioned, it's this story of the hermetic alchemical tradition, picture language and symbolical science of analogy and correspondence. We live in a very different age of science. We live in an age where people look and say, oh, well, that's just a pseudoscience. But if we were 500 years ago, we'd be looking at many of those people saying, oh, no, 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 that's just a pseudo art. Until your questions include love, humanity, compassion, and empathy, you're asking questions that are inhuman. So no matter what your answers are, they will never be art, they will never be caring, and they will never heal. They'll be quite fascinating, but they will have you. You will not have them. And that's kind of the mental martial art of all of this. What are you paying attention to? Because every sacred text says, listen, I'm going to throw up everything at you. It's all going to be actual. So the great question is, what do you pay attention to? There's things that are real, and there are things that are actual. That's what the tarot really helps us with. It says, hey, you know what? When you understand you live in a symbolical universe, you're going to stop screaming like a banshee all the time when it plays you. You're going to start thinking about more like a dream that said, wait a minute, if you look at a dream, you interpret it, oh, this is just a dream. Why do you take reality so seriously? Why don't you look at it more like a dream? Like the symbolism of what happened in your life. This is why synchronicity and these other qualities are coming to us so vibrantly now. I want you to trust that. And that's why the 22 archetypes are called keys. And the quote, our dear William Blake, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. Now, if you think of that, even in the tarot, the magus is transparent intelligence. What is transparent intelligence? I don't project my thoughts on what I'm looking at. I allow what I'm looking at to create thoughts. You see, I give myself to that question. And that, again, is a mental martial art. And in my book, I wrote this, but it's very important. Tarot is a tool, not a belief. Its genesis was and is an ongoing creative question. Its real value is that it helps an individual to ex examine life's myriad questions in new and creative ways. That's, that's one of the things that I think is really, I felt was so intriguing to me because it was saying, look, I'm a tool. Do you understand? And I think that that's why I really admire a lot of the people, because we have all of these evenings, different people present, they talk, and talk with, uh, with Sebastian. With I feel that this is getting at the realization that we've all come at this great question for a very long time from a lot of different directions. So there's a great deal of resource. And this is what defines Renaissance. Renaissance was never one person showing up. It was a quality of mind that began to hold within its own context. You know what? At least to me, this is interesting. And if you think about that growing, not a major seed, but a shift away from convincing others of a story you're not even convinced of yourself, turning around to saying, this matters to me, and using that as a source of amplification. And that's the, it, the tarot revision is an invitation to journey inward, and in so doing, to awaken the inner splendor of being human. Archetypal mind, inner reality, and creative vision are discovered only through journeying into the inner universes of eternal imagination. And to come on that, I wanted to quote our Mr. Blake again, because he says it beautifully. And I feel like, and this is actually something to try, because I found as an actor, the one thing you can't do is be logical. You can't be logical about your career. I tried that for years, and then I found, you're in an insane asylum. <laughs> Start realizing everyone's nuts, and you'll enjoy it more. And actually, I did enjoy it more. <laughs> because <laughs> um, it never made sense. Um, to open the eternal worlds, to open the immortal eyes of man inwards, into the worlds of thought, into eternity, ever expanding in the bosom of God, the human imagination. If you think of that, even putting the wheel down, the bosom of God, the human imagination, wow, what a thing. What a thing to be part of. I mean, we really don't take much time to think of how incredible the story we're in actually is, because we usually don't like the part of the story we're playing at that point. It would be easier if, and this is all about, no, 
you are that which is here to open the eternal eyes. And that's why this seal, and I sealed the book because I really wanted to create a work of beauty, because I agree with the Renaissance model that a thing of beauty tells you far more about what you're studying than any amount of words. So if it's beautiful, and that's why even my drawings, I wanted them to be beautiful, uh, so that you're invited without having to learn or think it's symbolical in the least. But if you are intrigued, then you go deeper, and it takes you on a journey. And the Arcanum Arcanorum is the story of the secret of secrets. And this is why the, the tarot has been called the holiest of holies. It's a picture book. And it's a picture book that contains universal knowledge. And that this universal knowledge is and it's in the grail as well, the seal. Natura non facet saltus. Nature does not grow in leaps. We have a very inorganic model of consciousness, as though you can take a pill and suddenly be conscious. You can't take a pill to play the cello either. So why would you think you could take a pill to be conscious? You can have an experience and you can have entertainment, but it is not developing a skill. And that's what the tarot gives us. In other words, if we have inner experiences, we need to have outer tools with which to anchor those experiences that aren't, oh, you know, I had this experience. It's like, well, share it with me then. And that's where theater came from. It really did. These inner experiences, these dreams, let's put them on. They're really interesting. And if we put them on, maybe we'll give them life in a way they can teach us that we couldn't see if we just kept them inside of ourselves. So if we use that model here, we begin to understand natura non facet saltus. Listen, guys. You're home now. It's a story of actually coming home as a tree, realizing the maturity was to realize we didn't actually leave. We matured to finally return. And that's why as we enter into the story of the Holy Grail, and we'll see here this story of the Grail, but we'll also see this relationship to the slowness, that it is a slow journey that begins with the mother in the ancient waters. And then she sends us on this journey across the ages to finally return as a phoenix. Because the journey of the grail is this weave of the cross of matter within the square of eternity, within the wheel of forever. You gotta like those constituent parts. They're much more interesting than you live, you die, and that's it, suckers. Saying, no, you're part of something that is as wonderful and wondrous as you are imaginative. And that's why you're stopped down. If you can't reach up to the knowledge, if you can't open to it, it waits for you. Think about joy. That's not happiness. Joy is when we feel ourselves connected. We rise up, and that which we rise up to rises down and meets us. And we realize who we are is something extraordinary. And that's what this is actually trying to remember, that each of us are the Holy Grail. That's why upstairs with the chalice, that's one of the great secrets here, that you couldn't know what the Grail was until you returned home. Because my true message is, I am the intimate part of what is sacred, meaning those you love. When you come from that level of truth and energy, that level of integrity, you don't ask, have to ask questions of, is this right or wrong? I know it is because I love. That's a way different level of truth and trust. But that, I'm convinced, is the level that is emerging. And that's why as we enter into the story, I'm, just, I'm not going to go into, of course, the symbolism, because that would take forever. Uh, but I really want to, more like a theater piece, say, listen, what if we look at this as entering? And that's why in my book, I don't go into a lot of detail. I just put, in the beginning, the pictures and the name. Because I wanted to create a tool that said, listen, I want to introduce you to the characters inside of you. The last thing I want you to do is go, well, what does that mean? And that's why I could have footnoted my book and made it a very academic sounding intellectual piece. But I said, wait a minute, I don't want you to think it's about that. I want it to be, let's have a drink together. Let's ruminate. Let's let these stories see, well, how does this feel in you? And that's why it's very important that this, and this was not something I did intentionally. I didn't intentionally create a black and white deck, and I didn't intentionally create a magus rather than a magician. It came naturally. I find the black and white is fascinating because this is much more primal and archetypal to be in black and white. Color is later. It's what we apply in a way, you'd say, from the piano, the music, from the black and white, the color. And the same thing here, we see the seed. Not a magician saying, sleight of hand, I'm tricking you, but a magus, a teacher of the ancient mysteries who says, ah, I ask you a question. Are your questions of life or death? Are they of fear or wonder? Because I'll tell you, let me ask you one question. Which seed grows a garden? Because if your seed grows a garden, you enter my arcanum arcanorum, because you're worthy of the questions of life. But if you expect to enter me because your questions are of death, 
you're not welcome. And that's the key to the mysteries as well. That's why when people say, it doesn't, no, 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 that's the door. You're not ready. Nothing personal, you're just not ready. Because this is a relationship. Romance is not given to schnooks. In other words, you become worthy of that deeper love. And that's why I think the whole point of tending the garden, not of the grand marble staircase, but of the linoleum, the human scale, not something that takes us away from that smaller self, but something that values that smaller self. And that, to me, is why Rumi is so popular these days, why Rilke is so popular, because they're saying you can't convince the angels with your grand emotions in the cosmos. You're just a beginner. So tell them of some word you've earned. Tell them of some word you've earned. I love that line. And then he goes on to say the blue gentian, how the lover's doorstep, each time we cross over that doorstep, wears away just a little. Or the music of the violin escapes the instrument and becomes a thing in itself. We know what that is. And that, to me, is the trusting of the instrument. And that's why the magus says, plant the seed. We even see the caduceus, the as above, so below, thrusting down the seed, planting the seed into the story of time and eternity. But we're also beginning with a seed. When we think of perennial wisdom tradition, it's very important because it's all gardening. <laughs> perennial wisdom says, listen, you're planting a seed that will die back and die back, but the seed has not died. It actually will keep rebirthing until finally it holds all that it was meant to become in that other state. And that's why the Magus then takes us to the High Priestess. And this is the other part that's important, is that as we start to use cards, as we start to think, I am the Magus, I am the seed. Everything I think is a seed. Everything I think I plant with intention. What is my question? Ah, and then the high priestess, you see, is the inside of the seed. The seed is not just the outside, not just the idea, but the inside, the sense of the depths of the mystery. So here we have this relationship of intention and mystery. Plant your seed in intention, but know the high priestess, the veiled one, she who could never be seen, rises up in you, not optically, but teaching you to trust your inspiration, trust your energy, and trust your knowing. And that's why with the Empress, she says, because she's number three. Now, also what's very interesting as well is when you look at these cards, start thinking about the numbers. Where do they fall? Three, seven, eight. It's all telling. That's the great thing, is once symbolical language starts to open up in you, it doesn't say, oh, you've got it wrong. It is much more of, as we know, a type of, through analogy and correspondence, the world starts to awaken in ways that says, trust not what is logical, but what is ambient. Trust that which finds its way to you and becomes optical through you. A bit like a performance. It's not something out here. It's something this way. And even that, in terms of the study of the Empress, she's saying the study of I am the doorway to all of these worlds. And as we go deeper into her, she is Sophia, the great mother. And so she is a great one to talk to about what is it that I value. She's love with a capital L. She's the sacred arcanum of true magic. True magic is the arcanum of love with a capital L. And that helps us understand relationship. And that's why it's also interesting in terms of psychology. If you think putting the family out, you see here's the great mother and then the great father, the emperor. And he will show us the story really of this setting in motion, the planting of the seed, because the empress is full of potentiality, like, like the womb like the egg. And then the, empress in a, the emperor in us steps in that and crushes it. You see, sets it in motion, and yin and yang, suddenly it's fiery. So we're starting to take that journey. And what's beautiful about all of this is it starts to really set a type of mythic adventure in motion for all of us that will take us into the Hierophant. And this is usually shown uh, very differently. This was one of my early drawings. But why this is also very intriguing is that when we have one, two, three, four, five is what? It's the line in yin-yang. It's the center thing. Well, the Hierophant has to do with the androgyny of consciousness. It has to do with the reconciliation between the masculine and feminine. And that's what's very interesting because much of this can't be known. You can say it, but when you start to see a visual, it says, oh, do you see the rhythmic flow, the figure eight, the blossom? the lily, and then we see the male face coming down into the world of four elements. 
and his mind is opening to the influence of Venus, and from her breast the milk of wisdom is flowing, but then her breasts become phallic, do you see? And we go from the phallic to the yonic. And if you think of that as a, as a wave, wisdom is not either or. It is the strength of form and the strength of surrender of form. And that's wisdom of the Hierophant, which interestingly enough, of course, gets us into why Venus rules Taurus. But that's a story for another night. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the lovers, this takes us in a way into a much deeper story of the lovers as I drew this because it was the story that from man, woman, from woman, man, and that our journey, we are not separate, but we really are lovers of both the sublime and the earthly. And that that's the great romance of the place. It's not there's only one type of love. No, here the stakes are really high. Here there's divine love and human love. And if you don't have to say one's it or not it, you start to realize that they both exist in each. And that's the deeper synthesis that the lovers are moving us to. And this is also quite, uh, quite a beautiful story. The chariot. This is something else I always feel with the drawings as well. Mudra. You know when they do the hands, this, all the, What this tells us is it tries to say, listen, you're a pattern body. So when you do these gestures, think, you might think, oh, I'm just doing it. But actually what you're doing is you're setting yourself in pattern relationship with these qualities of consciousness. So if you think of putting yourself into alignment, that's what these drawings help us also do. Because with the chariot, if you stand like this, and you start to hold a bow and an arrow, and you feel that where is this character coming from? You say he's not, he's not holding reins, he's divided this way. And you start to, like an actor, say, you know what? I'm going to see how that feels. I'm not going to figure it out. I'm going to see how that feels. When we start to figure how that feels, it starts to inform us. It's a bit like when the sculptor trusts the hands. And that's why a lot of this is, and I, I really do feel, is hold the position you see. Imagine holding those. And then if you say, well, where is it reconciled? The eye and the heart, which as well is divided on the vertical. So these keys, because the point of a philosophical drawing a philosophic drawing, is not, I want to prove how little you know and how much I do. No. It's the sense that, no, these are tuning forks. They're really meant to be, I want to strike this and see how it resonates in you. Because if it resonates in you, it will resonate in you differently than him. And between you, then, do you see there's a deeper resolution. And that's where the wisdom of the chariot takes us into the knowledge of the emotional nature, strength. This took me in a completely different direction from strength as it is usually presented as a woman holding the jaws of a lion open. But this really turned it out to be really uh, the story of the feminine incarnation of the Bodhisattva, of Kuan Yin. And she says, my strength is not the strength of swords and armor. Strength has nothing to do with overpowering. Strength has everything to do with alignment. Now think about this card also. Put that in front of you and hold this position. And then start to allow yourself. This is what the ancient techniques were about. Why our ancient texts would say, uh, when we read the Bhagavad Gita, as Krishna speaks, where am I not? Who am I not? When am I not? As that comes through me, I feel Krishna. As you say it, it comes through. You'll feel Krishna. That's the point of these energies. They're not abstract and outside of ourselves. They want to mediate through us. And that's why all of these systems and traditions were based on imaginative bridging. Meaning, if you can imagine it, if you can hold it, you'll begin to allow it into you. And like a gardener, if you don't try and turn it into something, but you allow it to find its way in you. Now think of a dancer. Finally, after all the rehearsal, the music is alive. No longer a question of the steps at all. But that's been prepared for. And that's why a lot of this helps us prepare our psyches and ourselves for our deeper energies. Because in a way, they say, you know what? You really don't think we're you. You've done such a good job of saying, oh, no, no, that's not me. We've done a really good job of making ourselves very, very, very small. And why this is important is the tarot is private. All of this is private. So you can actually confront those things. Why am I doing this to myself? Why am I making this agreement to be so small? Why am I stuck on my anger? What's, why can't I let go of this? What's going on? That's where it's helpful, because that's where you start to have a relationship with these qualities and characters say, listen, OK, you might be making this up, but you need to talk. So let's make something up together. And that's how you build a character. You don't know how to do it. You make it up. And then it starts to feel right. It starts to uh, you hold it right. 
And the hermit, again, as we look deeper, he will take us past all of the city limits. And my quote for him, and it's enough for tonight, is Rilke's quote, I want to be with those who know secret things or else alone. And I think a lot of us have gotten that way. What can we share that inspires enough of the critique? I'm taking care of that for myself. Um, and, uh, but the Wheel of Fortune again. Now, why this, of course, is so interesting, spending 17 years on these drawings, I did spend a lot of time on each of them. And really, each of the drawings then became a type of deeper mentor. And this is what I started to understand about the creative spirit. Because when I started the tarot, I thought I was a maverick. I'm, I'm a ma I've had discussion groups here for 37 years. Why I smile at that is I would have thought, oh, well, I'll never be in a discussion. I'm too much of a maverick. And I'll never do something like the tarot. I'm too freewheeling. What I found over the years was the discussion created the capacity to listen and hold a philosophical conversation that wasn't just about my opinion, but about the ideas that were being looked at. And the same thing with the tarot. It took me on a journey that took me well past anything I thought I knew. And that's why I always knew when it awakened, because I'd always go, wow, uh, that's a lot deeper than I thought. But think about that as the reference, not of the artist alone, but of us. You know, like that, we're a lot deeper than we think. It's like archaeologists that went, you mean we've been stopping at the second floor because they've been telling us to? And there's this whole other level? And it says, yeah, there is. And guess what? It's where you're private, where you're intimate, where you can close the door, not where you're proving something to anybody because that's not a romance. A romance is what do you do when you close the doors? And if you start from a romance, then you can offer the world that love because you're not trying to get something from it. You're trying to offer something to it. And that's etiquette. And that's why a lot of this is the study of the etiquette of energy and the story of justice. She's not a blind justice here. She's a dancer. Do you see? She's saying musically, I want to connect like the story here, above and below. And I want you to feel fine in all of those different rooms. Because some have to do with structure, so stay connected to the earth because the earth turns. But no, the sword is down, not up. It's really not a battle. It's how do we actually take care to know what these energies that compose us do. And she says, so let me, do you see, set the strings, the music, and that's why this all really has to do with the story of justice being the heart of musical equilibrium. And when we think about that, maybe that's the thing. If you can't figure it out with words, see if you can sing a song. See if you can figure it out in a different way. Because it can figure itself oftentimes because you went, this is stupid, but... And I can't tell you how often. I, I mean, my whole life is based in, this is pretty silly, but wow, that's... Because I think it's that sense of you have to get past. And that's why The Hanged Man, this I just suggest reading. This, will, this is all about the connection to the creative imagination. And we see the world upside down. And yet our deeper roots, our story that the vaulted self reaches down into this world. And yet as we turn, we have all of this access. But we essentially have to turn the way we think differently. You think about a martial art, right? It's not this or that. It's can I do this? Can you take what was this and do this? And that's what the archetypes help with, because they help in reading about them in particular. They help, because much of it, I feel like the happy archaeologist. I'm writing about things I wasn't expecting to know, but they really do go much deeper than anything that was written about them before. And I think it is because it comes from that creative relationship of not proving, but connecting. And death was my first archetype. So I entered the tarot through death, which is very appropriate. A uh, seed does not sprout, lest it die. So this story of death being the journey, and this is also about death and rebirth, death and life. And since there are 22, I'm, I can't dwell on 22. I have to sort of go quickly. I realized in the journey of this, 22 of anything is a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like beyond a lot. You're writing a book thinking there's 22, and there's 22 drawings. And I have to say, Every time, and this is why a lot of this is why I feel psychologically pretty healthy at this point, is because there is a terror, especially when your drawings turn out to be pretty good, but you haven't done the rest of them. So you've built kind of a high watermark for yourself, and you think you've kind of faked it for the first five. You're going, well, I was lucky. I just, I don't know where those came from, but I, oh my God, 
oh my God, and it kept going on and on and on. But I'm convinced that's part of the quest of our psychology. We keep thinking it's impossible. I'm not that, I can't do that. Only to find at the end of the day, we come back to where we began, realizing that that's exactly what life does to us. No, 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 I can't do that. I want to, oh, I survived. <laughs> and, that's, and that's temperance, really, when we look at this. This is really the story of tempering metal, uh, not, not like temperance, like teetotaling. But this has to do with the dark night of the soul, and temperance is such a remarkable archetype for entering into the relationship with that deeper sense of the philosophical soul. It says, I want you to understand. And that's what the drawing gets in. A lot of these are really meant to be studied closely because there are sleeping beings over here and then one waking being on the other side. And so the story is, through this tempering, through this fire, you will go from having been sleeping all this time to finally awakening. But of course it tells you, when you awaken, guess what, you're in a world where most people are still asleep. Uh, <laughs> that's where the devil comes in. Um, the devil actually, and this is very good news for us, because in writing about the devil, you know, the devil is, uh, you know, especially with Hollywood, the devil's gotten even a worse rap from, you know, I love you Hammer films, but <laughs> the devils have gotten the short end of the stick, because devils in all of our old mythologies really weren't the bad guy, they were the, they were the, they were the tempter. They were the one that said, listen, you said you're going to quit smoking, so <laughs> for the next 10 weeks, I'm going to get you to smoke, because I'm the devil. I'm not really bad, I'm just <laughs> testing you. And that's why a lot of these stories are about, like when I wrote about this, you know what the antidote to the devil is? Mirth, humor, laugh. You think about that. Yeah, the less, you, and I found this with out-of-body experiences. When I was, uh, and I did this for a long time, many years, um, and <laughs> And when I was out of body, if, if, and I was in some pretty scary situations, and the whole point was the energy would try and go, it was like lean into you going, I'm real. You're never leaving. I've got, and it's like you look, <laughs> breathe, ah, breathe. And it is, it's like a mental martial art, breathing, realizing that it's energy, and dissolving and allowing oneself to move through that. This is one of the helpful keys to all of this, is understanding that the psyche does not follow the rules of daylight, it has its own set of rules, and they're unique to each question we ask. A bit like taking the boat out. The ocean's going to be different every time we get it out of the harbor. And that's the tower. Now, I like to point this out. The archetypes in the tarot are called trumps. So I've created <laughs> 22 trumps. And since we have a President Trump, I also have to say I created a character when I was working on this trump when I was doing General Hospital called Damien Smith. And that character was based on Trump, about this idea of a man who lived in his own erections, his own tower. And, I, and, and, and of course, not making a political statement, but just being a symbolical theater lover, it says, ah, do you realize that the tower, this idea of I have what you don't, and this is where 9-11 comes in, and we're going to see with my world archetype, but also 9-11 triggers the upstairs. If you think of the falling away, the Tower of Babel, the twin towers of money and God, I have what you don't. These two brothers, across the ages, saying, I am this, 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 finally collapse. And that's what this is actually getting at, is that the tower energy, Mars, is the story that it will break down all traditions that have no longer serving a vital function. In a deep level, it's our creative energy. It's our will to form, to force, to impregnate. And this is why it is not controllable intellectually. It can't be shouted down. It is the very source of wrath. That's what we don't understand. We're fighting something with its nature. It doesn't work. And that's why the tower is a very good thing to be reading at this point because it helps us understand the symbolism of why many traditions, when they are challenged, are really forcing the people to think differently, to stop assuming the old way is the way. And we're at that now. That's why I feel this house is at the ocean, meaning that we can't, we've gone as far as the land can take us. The wagons have reached the edge. Now we have to figure out why we've gone through that. So as the towers, as the false erections of ego, of money, fall, they will fall back into home, into the intimate space of I thought I could make sense of the world by being a grand master and having a golden shower. 
<laughs> Golden bathroom. <laughs> that was completely unintentional, <laughs> at least consciously. Um, <laughs> um, and that story, though, you know, we reach and reach and reach. And if you think about coming this far in, in history and time, that the very things that have been the impetus to get us here are now forcing us to ask a different set of questions. The ego, when we return home, when it is armored and gets us through the difficulty of the world, isn't much good with those we love because we come back in armored and we have a different conversation with those we love than we should. So the question is, how do I take that off? Because the world has armored me. And that's also what the tarot and understanding the tower, because you see the naked figure there, the male with the lightning bolt? He's not armored. And you see the serpent? That's life. That's the vitality of the living tree, neurology, the nervous system. It's not something fixed. It's not architectural. It's alive. This is what it's trying to say. Feel this image in you. Start to feel yourself alive as a neurological tree. Start seeing in that tree all these faces that are you as well. But then rise to the top of this beast that is the tree, this primal instinctual being, and hold the lightning, literally the force and power of all creation, nakedly. Think of that. I mean, just as a dance. If you tried to do that physically, you'd be fried, and we know that. <laughs> so that's the point of, in theater, suspension of disbelief. You go, we're acting. Ding! <laughs> and that's why a lot of this is to be more like an actor than a believer, because if you go, thus I took the lightning and spread the beast's jaws, you think, no, 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 just play with the idea. Feel how it feels in the body, because that will also encode a great deal of the deeper informing energy of the tower. And the tower doesn't, many of these archetypes actually don't speak to us intellectually. We cannot know them unless we understand them and experience them energetically, physically. That's why a lot of our codes are, does this make you nauseous? Does this make you happy? Pay attention. Those are languages. And that's why the star, he turns not back who is bound to a star. This has great to do with aspiration. And we'll start to go deeper and deeper into this, but not tonight. Um, the moon is, uh, this I really and truly believe is a, uh, it's the next chapter in this archetype, because this archetype has not been understood, because it's been talked about by metaphysicians and those who are not coming from a place of creation and love, but from judgment and, in a sense, esoteric knowledge. The moon is only knowable through blood knowing. It's only known through corporeal wisdom, meaning that I take you into the dark, and as I seemingly drown you in my dark waters, I remind you, you are a great swimmer, but only you can learn to swim. There is no way I can bring light to this. It is in darkness that you will learn. And you will grow from this darkness to hold the light. And that's the beauty of her, this whole fall of Icarus, that we fall into the story that finally brings us back full circle to realize that it was no avoiding something. Do you see her power? This is the knowledge also of dark power, which is not talked about as well. Lunar power, the lunar mysteries. When I was writing about that, I thought, this simply hasn't been talked about. It hasn't been known, because in a way, it's, it's when you understand that history is political. What shows up, in a way, has to do with the politics of the reality we're going to consider to be real. It's like, why did the Dead Sea Scrolls show up in 1947? Why did the Nag Hammadi? And you can start putting the pieces together because its timing makes sense. And that's why we really are part of a great detective novel that says, pay attention to the clues. The clues is not a who done it. It's how do I put it together? Because it's almost like a puzzle, like you put it together, and then the puzzle shows you what it is. Because you've put it together. And that's actually the creative process here. And the sun, now this of course we think of Leonardo's Vitruvian Man, but, and I was stuck on the sun, and then the sun said, what about this? Not just this, and this, and this. Do you see this sense? So from the cross, the cube, Suddenly there's the embracing, and what's fascinating again, because I didn't know this is how I started writing about it, the relationship between the second birth and the third birth, the second initiation and the third initiation, the lunar mysteries and the solar mysteries. Now all of this takes us deeper and deeper into the story of a duality of vision, meaning can we hold the cross of matter as a benediction, a blessing, so that then this raises up as the chalice of wisdom so that we are able to apply it with the focus of these two eyes. Do you see how solar wisdom is inclusive? But that's why also the picture is so important. Because it says, listen, I just want to see how this feels in you. 
And I want to tell you that this is you. You are the sun. You are the moon. You are, as we'll see now, judgment. This I also highly suggest in my book, Reading, because this is one I, when I drew this drawing and when I wrote the uh, chapter, neither did I feel that I was anything other than at this arm's length, as if I was writing about something that was so ancient, so deep, and so beyond anything personal. It's a truly, because this is Pluto, it's transpersonal. Judgment is shin, the life energy. And this is the question, really, that brings us back to the true integrity of identity. There is no I and thou. There is no judgment of I against you. And as long as you believe that, I will draw you into chaos. Think about that. I mean, that's really quite extraordinary because then the, this becomes a way of saying, can I talk to you at least? It says, yeah. But remember, I'm not going to talk to you with words that you're going to be familiar with. I'm going to start taking you on a journey that says you are much more ancient and much darker than you think. But I don't mean dark as something bad. I mean dark as something powerful that has shut itself down until you reclaim your energies. Think about a ring past knot, right? I'm shutting you down until you stand up to me. And that's where we have her here, do you see? The atomic explosion. This is the wheels of forever falling back, but the kundalini, this atom relationship that finally we rise up and we rise up as her. Do you see this great gesture of rising up so that the angel is reaching down? That's a relationship. Do you see? That's what's important. And that's why when you read the images, it's not just one thing or another. They're actually in a great set of relationships. And this is where we come to the second, to the final one, which is the world. It's the last numbered archetype, 21. There are seven sets of three, or three sets of seven in the tarot. All of these have vast and fascinating meanings. Four, eight, and 12 do as well, but that's another story. And why this is impo <coughs> excuse me, important is that this started to teach me about the prophetic uh, sublime and why art and prophetic art is not prophetic religious or uh, spiritual. Because prophetic spiritual religious is, I've got the new book, show up, there's a new God in town, a new teaching. But, a, but creative revelation is what we hear when you hear Elvis for the first time. I mean, there's just something that bowls you over because it's not really the person. It is something coming through that person. That's why I say very deeply that this is very much how I feel. William Blake said it best. And I, and I said, to speak to future generations by a sublime allegory, I've created a grand poem. And I may praise it because I dare not pretend to be the author. I am but the secretary. Its authors are in eternity. Now this is the world archetype dated 9-11-1986, so 15 years to the day of the falling away of the Twin Towers, to reveal the story of the world, which is Saturn. Now you think of the world wanting to tell us a story, and in this house it does. It says, now you hold the structure below, the world, the ring of structure. And in this, the mother, the ancestor returns, the tree that says, now I remind you, you are in all of these worlds simultaneously, as you know this, you will begin to trust the blossom, trust your imagination. You will understand, like training wheels, this duality was necessary, but you'll begin to trust your own spine. And as you do, you will trust the crown chakra, the crown chakra that opens and brings you into this world, that sense of wonder that becomes so closed down as you stand up. But she says, now, do you see, now that you're home, now that your ring holds you, and it's not trying to hold the whole world, but bringing the world into what is intimate, then we can be together. And that's Saturn, that's structure, because you're finally inside of you. You're not standing adjacent, waiting to be someone else. You're finally in love with who you are meant to be, which is my beloved. Do you see? And that's her story. She opens that sense of, oh, thank you. <laughs> but that's, I think, for the symbolical theater tonight, what is so important is to realize that, that 32 years ago, this drawing was created that becomes a message to all of us from Saturn and the world. It says, in the mid-'80s, you're going to begin a long period of, uh, in a way, disillusionment with your politics. You're black and white. You're going to stop thinking, oh, if this happens and that happens. In a way, it's not going to be another key. It's not going to be about history at the end of this. 
she's going to say, like the wheel. And that's really important because the tarot wheel is, it's a wheel. We come full circle. And Saturn says, look, let me show you a picture. I'm a planet, right? I've got a ring. If you look at me from the side, you see the ring divides me. It's like this house. You think above and below are separate, if you didn't know better. Because if I took you up there without telling you how you got there, you'd think it was not connected. That's what Saturn tells us. Do you see how I divided you for so long? So finally, and think of a divided eye, right? That finally lifts so we see the whole eye, the pupil. And that goes up over our heads. And that's why Saturn is the final personal planet. It says, when you trust the eye of Saturn, when you trust the eye of the Bodhisattva, when you trust the eye of wonder, you have created the form of being human. And this is important because if you create the form of being human, you want to return to being human. You don't want to keep going. And that's the ring past nod. Most of us, given a choice, would say, I'll keep going. That's not the right response. No, I will stand and allow my mind to embrace this greater truth and bring it back through the human structure to be shared within the world of time because Saturn is time. And Saturn is not just our time, but all time. So it says, in all of the times you've lived, you've created an enormous weave of what does it mean to be human. You are woven of this weave. And Saturn says, I do not give gifts. You, in your seeking to become worthy of me, realize I am not a devil, but a beautiful woman. But until you become worthy of me, I will be a devil, because I'm not interested in what you think you deserve. You're much more interesting than that. And that's why the last part is the fool. And the fool says, come on, guys. Joy is the key. Drink deeply. Live vibrantly. Be free. No one knows. And that's why the fool becomes the zero. And I love that, that this fool is actually, we see, stepping on, again, the wheel of time and eternity, poised with this sense of, don't you realize, you're part of a great cosmic dance, I almost said joke. <laughs> yeah, we're still finding it funny. Um, <laughs> but that sense the fool really does, it, it is about, and, and what I feel very strongly, the fool brings us back to the sense. And this is why I love my old roommate, uh, as a classmate from Juilliard, Robin Williams, and there's an honor up there in the hieroglyph. Because Robin made us see the world in a way we couldn't imagine. But he made us see the world in a way we wanted to imagine because it made us laugh and forgive and heal because we thought, you know what, as crazy as being angry at you is, it's really silly. Let's lighten up a bit. Because that's why I really do feel the fool in the tarot is that center of the wheel and the circumference. He says, I want to bring you back to your heart. Because your heart, although it's yours, is a human heart, meaning it's hers and his. Because the human heart is given to each. And that's the beauty of who we are. So the fool says, when you get out there and you go, <gasps> come back here, because this is the most precious truth of who you are, and it will free you to be daring, free you to be, make a fool out of yourself. And I always say that great performance is based in the willingness to make a complete ass out of yourself. Mm -hmm. You've got to be willing to make a complete goof to sometimes find what works. And I say that because as an artist, that is half the time how many things that turn out to go, I, oh, wow, that's brilliant. Do I tell people how that happened? I kicked over the ink, you see, and it spilled, and it started, it's really that, and to a lot of this is I feel there's this other process saying, you know what, let's trust the keys, let's trust the truth that we are the living grail, and that we can understand tarot revision, leemcloskey.com, and the last part is how to use the cards in the book. And now I'll turn off this, but I just wanted to show you the wheel and to see if you had questions. But that's really the end of my cheerleading. Um, I, I do feel very strongly that, that this is a, a true uh, gift in the way that our creative imaginations are saying, you are the technology, you are as interesting as the questions you ask, show up, show up and be curious because this is the beginning of something remarkable in the human story. And we're the ones that are here to remind each other 
that there is something remarkable happening, but as storytellers, we're the ones invested with the responsibility to tell the story. So tell the story, and I tell you, the archetypes will join you because, like everything, they've been waiting a long, long time for us to go, wow, I never knew we had such a remarkable relationship because I was always so busy trying to get away, but now I'm home. And they say, yeah, you are home. So you're home. That's the end of my talk, and then I'll do the <laughs>